Okay, so our next speaker is Val Swiller. Val is a professor of physics in KTH, in the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. Uh, he has expertise in nanophotonics and um, has been uh, particularly active in the area of gen generation of light, uh, like single photon Thank you. sources, transmission and, and detection. And we look forward to hear what is the story so far, Val? Thanks, Cecilia. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward also for all the discussions, uh, lab tours and so on. And of course, more yeah. collaborations. And I'm, I'm coming back anytime you want. So <laughs> definitely looking for EU, uh, EU collaborations of all kinds. Um, so I am based in, in Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, what I do for a living is I play with single photons. And just with the, the, the beautiful talk by Francesc, we just, we just heard, I mean, what I really like is nanofabrication and, and to make quantum devices. But in my, in my case, it will always be with single photons in mind, but uh, single photons in the sense that I want to, let me try this, yes. I want uh, to generate, to manipulate, and to detect light at the single photon level. And for this, we need quantum devices at the, at the nanoscale to be able to do that. Um, what, so this is working, as I was already said, at KGH in Stockholm. Uh, we also started a company called Single Quantum 10 years ago now in Delft, where I was before, and this is going uh, rather well. So we have a lot of the nanofabrication and, and research done for single photon detection done there. This is why I, I mentioned them. We have a real R&D team uh, there, and they will be part of, of my presentation here. Uh, so I'll answer what I'm going to tell you is very simple. First, part one is uh, how do you generate uh, single photons, right? So quantum sources. Uh, and wh why, why, why do we do that? Why do we generate... Uh, Single photon. What we have in mind is mostly quantum communication, but we also have projects on quantum computation and quantum sensing. Okay, but quantum co communication, I think, is something that is really. I mean, it's not. I think it is already on the market. You can already go and buy a quantum communication system. Maybe not based really on true single photons and so on, but I see that we are getting there. And also, one thing that is, I think, very relevant for quantum communication is that once you communicate at the single photon level we address another thing that has been nicely mentioned already in, in, in the morning, that is uh, uh, power usage. Right? Currently, uh, the internet, as we heard, is using something like 10 to 20% of the world's energy uh, as electricity uh, production, okay? And how does the internet run? Well, it's laser pulses going down fibers, right, to a large extent. Right? And if you take these laser pulses down to the single photon level, right, which I hope we can help do, uh, well, you're taking at least that part to the, the physical quantum limit. Yeah, so I, I think that's one of the reasons why we'll be going towards single photons in the future, maybe not even for, truly for quantum as in itself, but just for energy efficiency, I, I think, my, my guess. Um, so I'll tell you about that. Then I will also tell you about integrated quantum photonics, where we try to put everything on a chip, right? With them having in mind what has happened to electronics when they started putting things on chips 50, 60, 70 years ago. And that, of course, tell you about single photon detectors, because without single photon detectors, you can't do anything here, right? So. There we go. So quantum sources, light for quantum communication. This is what we have in mind. Right? So what are we after? What is the wish list? This is the wish list okay, of what, what would be a good, a useful, and interesting single photon source. And here we go. What we want from that source is to be bright, pure, and on demand. Right? Bright meaning that whenever I ask for a single photon, I want a single photon to come out. That's what I mean by brightness. Each time I ask, I want one. And then, I'm, and then you want it to be pure. Because if it sometimes gives me two photons or three or zero, it's not pure. I really want one each time. So this is what I mean by purity. And on demand, I mean timing. I want it when I want it, okay? Not a nanosecond later, okay, or before. So I always see this, this clocking ability. And what I've been showing you uh, many times in the, in the coming uh, slides is this is the smoking gun for this. This is a correlation measurement. I'll try to describe it a little bit later. But the missing peak here at time zero is that we come with a, an excitation pulse. It can be electrical, it can be optical. And we want to get one photon out for one. Pulse, okay, excitation pulse. And this is the smoking gun. I'll come back to this. This is already a lot to ask for, and no one is doing all of this uh, well yet. And anyway, we still have all the things on the wish list. We want it to be coherent. We want that photon to, that comes out to be as coherent as possible because we're going to interfere with them for quantum communication and especially for com com computation and even sensing. We need coherence as much coherence as possible. The physical limit is the Fourier limit, right? Delta E delta T simply, right? And that's another thing that is really a lot to ask for, okay? Reason, I want to have a quantum source in Stockholm. I want to have another one in Barcelona, okay? And I want those to travel and I want to interfere them somewhere in Paris or in Amsterdam, yeah? So that's, that's what I need to do. And for this, I need coherence. 
No, I also need telecom wavelength, not any color, because if all of this is done for, let's say, green photons like this laser I'm using now, well, it would not go down in the fiber. I mean, it would go down, but meters. And I want to go the longest possible distance. So I need this is what an optical fiber will transmit. And you can see we must be at 1.85 microns. Oh, 1.3 is not so bad, but 1.5 is the best. So we also have a particular wavelength to aim for, okay? Then single photons are fun, but it's always more fun to be two, right? So if you have two, you can have entanglement, quantum entanglement, a major resource for all kinds of quantum, uh, you know, computation and so on. So it's something we also look for. So you, and then the list is not yet done, but I have also I want this to be compact. Currently, I need an optical table to make one single photon source. And I want to fit, you know, thousands, if not millions in a mobile phone at some point, right? So we have a lot of work there. This is also scalability, what I mean. Indistinguishable. I was saying I want to have a source in Stockholm, one in Barcelona, right? They should be as current as possible. They should also, they must also be emitting at the exact same frequency, exact same frequency. Okay, that's uh, uh, indistinguishable. Okay, and, and another measure. And then because I come from the city of uh, Greta Thunberg, right? I have to tell you about power efficiency as well, because the experiments I'll be telling you and showing you now, I think, are the most inefficient measurements experiments ever done in the history of mankind. Yes. So I'm like lucky she doesn't know about this. So here is an artistic view of the type of devices we, we make and we use to, to, make a, to make our single photon sources. So we collaborate for many, many years already with our good friend uh, Armando Rastelli in, in Austria. And this is the artistic view of the device there with the quantum dots. These are three, five materials, okay? Like we've heard about uh, uh, this morning. And we have a DVR mirror below, mirror on top. We have some optical elements on top to get the light reading where we want it, straight up. Then we have a piezoelectric uh, crystal just below, okay? And uh, this is going to, we use this to strain the semiconductor. And what happens when you strain a semiconductor, you modify the, the band structure. Tuning, we change the band gap. That's how, and, and, and even more, but this is what we do. This is the real device, not as beautiful as the, this, right? Obviously, but this is the real thing. Here's the piezo thing. The, 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 of course, the, the three five is a membrane, very narrow. So it's, it's lost in the black epoxy we use to get everything together. And then there's a little lens on top of it. And then we have to do lots of optical experiments and things. And I will, I will not take you out down to the details of the optical, uh, quantum optical uh, systems. But what we have is X is the exciton, one electron in one hole, okay? And when these recombine, excite, when these recombine, they give us one photon. So this is really what, what we want to generate. Now you can, of course, also have two excitons, two electrons and two holes, okay? We call it the bi-exciton. We note it XX, okay? And what we can do if you do two photon excitation, we tune our laser so that we absorb exactly two photons and then we produce exactly, we generate a bi-exciton. That's a very clean way to excite a quantum dot, the cleanest we know of so far. So no extra energy we make, we absorb two laser photons and then we have this bi-exciton. And the bi-exciton then recombines, it gives us one photon. It can go, because of spins, right? You can spin up or spin down. So you have two ways you can go. We can generate this next thing with the spin up or with the spin down. Okay, so it will generate one photon first, the bi-exciton, leaves an exciton and one photon traveling. And then the second one comes, pop, cascade, we get the second photon, okay? And we can, we're then free to choose to measure on this one, measure on that one. And when things go well, they are entangled. When things go very well, we also have a pair of entangled photons. Right? So we can have a source of single photons, a source of entangled photons with this approach. And there's many technical issues, okay, which kept us busy for years. So for instance, here's the problem. Uh, this emission here and this emission there, there's going to be on the spectrum, one here, one there. And right in the middle, right, we have the laser. And the laser is, you know, microwatts, if not milliwatts, whereas these are just single photons. So the filtering already is a major technical challenge. But it's worth it because what I show you here is a spectrum or two spectra taking the same quantum dot, okay? And this is if we use a green laser, just like the one I'm using now to point here. If I use a green laser, Okay, I get a mess. I get lots of, exit, of, of, of lines from emission from the, from the quantum dot, right? This was, Clevia worked on this 20 years ago already, right? And, and this is, yeah. So this is a, a major issue because what are these lines? What is the nature of all these lines? Well, because we come with this green laser, I don't do it like this, no, I, I excite somewhere there. And they have all this extra energy in my quantum dot. And I join charge excitons, an extra electron, an extra hole, two, uh, two extra electrons. It is a whole mess, a whole mess, and this is why I get all these lines. If I no switch to this scheme here, the two photon excitation, I do these very clean bikes and look at what I have. Only two lines. One line is the bike exciton, the red one, and the other one is the blue one. That's it. So I clean up the spectrum of the quantum dot by exciting it in a clean, simple way. Yeah? 
all right, here we go. Then I have Rabi oscillations, just to say that it's a coherent system. It's quantum incoherent. Of course, when you deal with many other quantum systems, like superconducting systems, you are used to see Rabi oscillations going on or your NB centers for many, many periods. For us, at our temperatures, with our three, five quantum dots, we're just happy to, to see a few oscillations, but we, it's good for us and we're happy with that. This is the same thing. It's just the Rabi oscillations shown in another thing, but for the exciton, for the bi-exciton. Okay, so I'll fly over this one in view of time. This is another view of the setup. So I was saying, here's the quantum dot, which we keep at the temperature of the order of four Kelvin. Two, six, five, 10 Kelvin is just fine. This has to be, let's say below 20 Kelvin. We're not asking for mini Kelvin at all here. So a few Kelvins is fine. And I'll come back to this if I have time, the cooling issues, okay. And then we have a special laser, which actually took this very particular wavelength. It has to be pulsed and so on. So there's quite some work there. And, and then there we go. And then we have the single photon detection, which I'll come back at the end of my talk. But as I said, uh, thinking about Greta Thunberg, uh, this here, the laser system takes about a kilowatt. I have two cryostats, which each take about a kilowatt. So I am, I am using something like three kilowatts and maybe more in my lab. And why do I generate with the three kilowatts of electrical power? I generate a stream of single photons with these little red balls. And this is in the femtowatt, let's say if we're at ambitious picowatt level. So you can do the math. I think we're the most inefficient, I mean, of history, right? So that's the problem. I mean, even an order of magnitude of improvement would not even be noticeable. Right? We can go up by five, 10 orders of magnitude before we start to be remotely efficient. So a long way to go. But this is what we have here is at the time, and still no, as, as far as I know, uh, the cleanest single photon source uh, ever that has been reported as far as we know. So what, I, what do we do? Every 12 nanoseconds, we come with a laser pulse that is the pulse that says on demand, now we want a single photon. Okay, we hit the corner with a single pulse, laser pulse. And what we do now, we have two detectors looking at what comes out and we measure the coincidences between these, these two detectors. Okay, now, if only one photon comes from the first pulse, we get one, but no coincidence, we will have to wait for the next pulse to generate the second photon to the coincidence. Hence, what we're after in this field is to see that at time zero, this first pulse, we have no co coincidence, no correlations, and they're all subsequent. If I do the same measurement on the laser, on the light source of any other kind, it's not quantum, but the sun, a light bulb, whatever, the first peak will be equal to all the others. Only a single photon source will have a vanishing peak here. And the question, the past 20 years has always been, how much can you suppress this? And here's what we could do. We, if you zoom in here, you still have 21 events, but the neighboring one has something like 280,000 events. And the ratio of the two, even here, tells you how clean it is, right? So this means 10, in, yeah, in 100,000 times, on average, it will not work. It will not be a single photon source. But 99.999 times of the time, um, percent of the time, it's a single photon source, okay? So that's what we have, a very, very clean single photon source on demand. What I've shown you was at uh, arbitrary wavelength, and now we've done this also now all in um, at KGH. Uh, so Matthias Hamar in at KGH has grown this uh, this this uh, system where the quantum dots are engineered to emit around 1.55 microns. Okay, and we do the same thing. We put it in the piezo. We make a membrane. So the so you, you heard about, and those are color coded spectrum. And what you can see is that uh, we have different lines. This is not the two photon excitation. So we have the exciton, the bison, all kind of charged state. But anyway. We can follow the, and now what we can do by applying a bias, a voltage on the, on the piezo from zero to 600 volts, we modify the emission energy. <coughs> we change the color of the emission, yeah? Which unit, okay? By squeezing the quantum dot, right? And we can stay there for some time to make sure it stays there. We can go back to zero, we can go the other way, minus 200. So we have this tuning, yeah? Which is very important, as I said, because I want to have a source in, in Stockholm and one in Barcelona and many others, and they have to be at the same frequency. And nature will never give us quantum dots that always are at the exact same frequency. So we must have a nub to be able to, to, to act on this. And this is what we think is the, is the solution. And then what's nice, once you have 1.5 microns, you can do this very simple measurement. What I show you in black is a spectrum taken on a quantum dot in the lab, okay? And then we take the exact same thing, we put it in optical fiber, because we have 1.5 microns. Finally, it took us you know, years and years to get there. But now we can put 13 kilometers of optical fiber and measure again, and it's shown in red, you see? More than half of it still comes out after 13 kilometers of fiber. And this you cannot do with any other wavelength. So this is the justification for all the work at 1550. You always hear from the referees, well, there is no new physics. You know, you're just doing the same thing at a new wavelength. But I mean, if you talk about users, this is major. But if you go to PRL, this is not going to help you. And then we again do the same kind of measurements. Is it single photons at 1.5 microns? Here is it. It's not 
Ultra clean is the first one I've shown you, but you see that there is no cor few correlations at time zero. So we have a single photon source on demand at 1.5 microns. This is exciting for another reason. I mean, first we can go in optical fibers, but we can do more than optical fibers. We can talk to our friends at Ericsson, just down the street, essentially. And now we can tell them, well, we have these quantum things at 1.5 microns in the fibers. Can't we use your toys that you always use for classic communication, but at 1.5 microns? So what we got in this particular case was a phase modulator, okay, of the shelf. I mean, just for the fancy ones they, they, they have, but this is, this is what they have, okay, used for classic communication, okay. But now, because we, we, we have our single photon, what five microns, but we could use it. We could use this to phase modulate single photons. And this is what you can see. We can modulate over here. This is what's shown in the spectrum here, over 53 gigahertz. So it's just to say we can now take off the shelf systems, designed and built and used for classic communication, but use them now with quantum light, if you want, right? And, and do all kinds of things that, uh, and we can show that we, we, we see. it's not perfect, right? It's supposed to be zero, but anyway, before and after, we, we, we keep our quantum nature of light while uh, adding some, some, some frequency modulation in this case with off-the-shelf equipment. And there's much more we can do with off-the-shelf equipment now, at telecom off-the-shelf equipment at 1.5 microns. I just want to now also introduce another type of quantum dots. These are quantum in nanowires. So we've heard about nanowires before. These are three, five nanowires, which we get from a friend in, in Ottawa, in, in Canada. And what they can do, they grow those. I spare you all the dip. I'm happy to talk about it. But there's a little whitish thing here. This is the quantum dot. So it's a, it's a region with a lower band gap in the arsenide phosphide, in the nidium phosphide and wire. So this is going to act as a quantum dot. And if you control the size and shape of that quantum dot, you can, for instance, aim at 1.3 microns, another telecom wavelength. Yeah. And this is what you can see here. So the, the red or black dot here would be, would be emitting a telecom wavelength. So you know about this also. And I also already told you that when we project the bi-exciton, here it is, this is the bi-exciton, two electrons and two holes. Yeah. Uh, it will, if things are fine, I spare you the, the quantum physics involved here, but if the two energy levels of the excitons are degenerate or very close to degeneracy, then both paths are indistinguishable. And then the two photons that come out are entangled. All right? And then we do this experiment. It's a little, a little bit more sophisticated, but we again see single photons. But since this is single photons of one frequency, the bi-exciton, a bit bluer. Then we have also the same thing that we see also see for, for the exciton in the next slide there. Oh, I'm missing that. Anyway, so we, we see this for the bi-exciton and for the exciton, so single photons, but in a cascade. So we have one exciton, uh, even one photon first on demand, and the second photon on demand, the cascade. And these are entangled. So I spare you these details, the technical details of how we measure. This is the density matrix. So when you, you want to show that the quantum state is entangled, you measure the density matrix and the up diagonal elements being high and the, the other ones very low, tell you that you have entanglement. So here we have. Uh, 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 nicely, oops, nicely entangled state here um, with a fidelity of 95 persons. So it's not 99.9 yet, but I mean, this is what we have at 1.5 microns. Uh, so very, very useful uh, because now we also have entanglement. A problem we have that again takes us back to nanofabrication. And this is a problem that is shared with the LED industry is that semiconductors that we use, like uh, all others, have very high refractive indexes. 3, 3.5 is very usual. And we want to get the light out of those, right? We want to get our single photons out of the, of the structure. And that's, that's, a, that's a problem. The light tends, of course, naturally to remain trapped into the high refractive index material. So how do you get the light out? What we tried, and with some success, is to fabricate microparabolas, where we'd like the corner to be at the focus of the microparabola. So here's a, during the process, you see, we're able to etch, wet etch, and so on. Uh, well, dry edge and then wet edge, a bit like what we've heard before in of, of, of approach to make microparabolas and we gold coat them and then we like invert them, I mean, flip, flip chip them and so on. And then at the end of the day, we have, as you see again, good single photon behavior. Again, no peak at time zero. And uh, before, after, before is dashed here, the device, the quantum dot, so you see, we multiply by 10, very weak, and after, much stronger. So it does get us much more light out. But we still, we as a community still have a long way to go because we want to get all of the photons out. And we're still very, very far from this. We're still extracting only you know, 10, 20 percent of the, of the light in the best device, in the best cases. So still a lot to do to be done. And also we would like this to be fiber coupled. Yeah, because now we still use a non cryo with an optical window, all kind of optical elements, a whole optical table behind. What we need at the end of the day is a fiber coupled device where everything goes in and out through the optical fiber and no more all these optical elements. Or couple it to a waveguide. 
this is what takes me to part two of the presentation. What about integrated quantum uh, circuits, right? Um, so the idea, uh, the idea here is, uh, is to put everything, I mean, the inspiration is of course not new. It's a bit obvious, I, I would say. I think we all agree on that. It's just looking at what electronics has done in the past, I would say 60 years, right? Let's do it with optics. Yeah. So uh, that's the, the idea. We have a single photon sources, waveguides. We can manipulate the photons in all kinds of ways and detect them. So I'll just tell you a little bit how we do this. We like these nanowires that I've just shown you briefly before that we get from our friends in Canada. We can take them, transfer them on a second wafer and fabricate then uh, a waveguide on top, on selected waveguides. And I have a movie coming up. Is it saved during the, yeah, it's, it came with a memory stick. There you go. So this is, a, of course, artistic, right? But it's kind of what we do, right? It's kind of what we do. Uh, of course, it depends on the student. Some students are really good at this and some will never master it. And I will never master it. So it depends on, um, you know, the patience and, and so on and training abilities. But you can, under a microscope, optical microscope, it is possible to come and uh, pick up a nanowire and then put it flat on a, on a silicon substrate. It can be done, it has been done, we do it now. Um, and of course, why do we do this? Also because all, as I said, all dots are not equal. So what we start by doing is doing studies on many of those and select the good ones and then take the good ones. Because I have to say, I mean, one person or so may be good. So, nine, so you need this, you need this selective step. This is what we have, then we put the nanowire lying flat, bluff, okay, on an oxidized silicon wafer, there we go, okay. Then we deposit silicon nitride, okay. We etch it, even with agraphy and etching, so things that are done routinely here as well, right? And then we have our quantum dot selected into a waveguide. And now we can do it. And this is, this is essentially it as far as far. So here's an artistic view of the very first devices. We, when we started the whole thing, the nanowire artistic view, the single photons, the single red ping pong balls going in the waveguide. And here's the real thing. So although the nano is very small, I mean, it's a few microns in length, but nanometer, tens of nanometers only, in, in, it scatters enough light that we see it in an optic microscope. The pinkish thing is a silicon nitride, and you see we just bring this waveguide that, that, that meanders a little bit here and there. And again, a time zero, the usual thing, single photon behavior. Not perfect, again, yeah, not zero, but anyway, quantum. Um, some surprises, I mean, I don't want to overwhelm you with all these kind of technical details, but you see, we take a spectrum um, as uh, here in red, it's a spectrum we take on the nanowire, and we say, we like this nanowire, we're going to transfer this one because it's a beautiful spectrum, only one beautiful line, essentially. I mean, this, we can, uh, we're not theorists, so we can ignore this, okay? So we take this one, we transfer it, we make a device, and we take the spectrum again. It's in blue, and you see what happened. And there's a shift in frequency. These are nanometers. It's shifted by like a good nanometer. Unexpected, unknown, surprising. The spectra, and this always happens, the spectra are not the same from the nanowires or the quantum dots as grown af compared to after processing and transfer. Because of course we put silicon nitride, so the strain is different and so on. So we modify the environment. And you know, it's quite a sizable shift. I mean, that is still not fully understood. Is it strain? Is it charging states? I mean, we don't even know. And we tried all kinds of experiments, including synchrotron in Grenoble to try to, to understand and it's not, nothing very conclusive. But we can also make more uh, interesting devices, a, a, a resonant a ring resonator, a ring resonator here. So it's a, there's the silicon nitride waveguide there. We have a, our quantum dot is somewhere there back there. So it's spitting out single photon this way. And now we have this ring resonator coupling to the waveguide, okay? And what we have here is a ohmic uh, heating device. So we can, we can warm up the ring resonator. When we do this, we tune it. Yeah, we modify the, 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 the optical constants and then, uh, and then, and then uh, of course, we, we, we can tune, bring in resonance out of resonance. And this is what you see, just merged in white light by we can, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can see that this ring is going to send a given frequency out in the through part, do nothing to this here, or it can be in resonance and then the, the light ends up in the drop part, okay? And we now do this on, on, the, on the device where we have a single photon source and a quantum dot in the, in the waveguide, okay? And we can look at the through part, for instance, one of the two parts, or the drop part, we look at both of them, obviously, okay? And what we see now is we are applying a, a voltage on the ring resonator. Okay, so we're warming up the ring, we're tuning the ring resonator. What do you, what do we see? Let's look at the, ex, the exciton, all right? The exciton, as we increase, okay, so it, it comes out, the emission from the exciton comes out in, in the through part, through part, through. And, oh, it's gone here, black, gone, all right? So from output one side, it's gone. And we look at output two, right? The one way it would have gone through the ring resonator and not the other one. And yes, it appeared there. So when it's gone there, it's there. And when it's again gone there, oh, it's back there. 
So we can really choose now by applying the right voltage on a ring resonator whether the exciton photon will go in this arm, in this waveguide, or that one. The same goes for the T line, the tri and the charge exciton, and so on. Uh, okay, of course, it's not the best thing ever. We did some time ago because using warming up our device is not good. So we, we have better, and I'll, I'll come back to that very soon. Uh, but nevertheless, what we show again, single photon behavior. So I can I think we don't have to spend too much time on this one, just to show that what we're able to do is filter things. This enables us now to on the chip filter out uh, any laser light. If there was laser light in, you know, used to excite the convert, for instance, well, we can block it, I mean, or block it, or at least filter it out uh, on chip. So that's already very useful and so on. Then we always ask, is it scalable? Because we have uh, lots of friends and colleagues who want to build quantum computers based on this type of, of, of systems. But obviously you don't need, the, you can't do it with one, not even with 10. You may need a million or a billion, it's not clear, but at least a billion, let's say. So we went for two, yeah. Uh, and this is, we'll just show you that there is some scalability. So again, all dots are different. So you see that dot one, dot two, although they're from the same batch, nominally the same, they have different spectra, okay. But we nevertheless can, build a system like this where we can now use the ring resonator to select whether the output, the emission from quantum dot one in blue will come out this way at a given voltage, or we can send the output from quantum dot two from this at another voltage. And we can do that. Then of course, is it scaled enough? We always know. So then we went for six. So now we have six of those and uh, each of with our own ring resonators. And so, so we are showing that it is scalable to that kind of numbers, right? 10, 100. But of course, if you want a million, we'll have to, to invent many more things. But uh, anyway, this is a way to really get uh, selected single photon sources on cheap and build uh, superly complex architectures around these, these, these things. And there are quite some companies going in this direction, uh, not using this type of, 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 of quantum sources, but, but and nevertheless aiming at quantum computation. And the last part of my presentation is, of course, uh, about detection. Okay? I, I have a, a first glimpse here. We need to detect these single photons. Otherwise, we're just philosophers, right? So we need to detect the photons. And here's my first view of a single photon detector that we like. I'll come back to this uh, later. Uh, this is a, a nanowire, but made by sputtering. Yeah, exactly the same thing that we have in down the hall here on the way to the coffee, an AJA system to sputter the niobium titanium nitride. And then we make a thin film, we etch it, even lithography and etching. And this is niobium titanium nitride. And this nanowire here is a single photon detector. And what we can do then, here it is shown here, optical microscopy here. And we have the waveguide here. This is a, we can put the single photon detector into a waveguide. So that we have single photon sources, filtering, routing, and now also uh, detection. And I'll of course tell you much more about the detectors in the coming slides. What we have here is another kind of integrated photonic circuit where what we have are quantum dots uh, provided by friends in, in Belgium, which emit at uh, about a micron something, 1.1 micron or so. And um, they are, the quantum dot is coupled to that waveguide here. So the light from the single, the single photons from the quantum dot travel this way. And then we have made here in this device here, a very tiny uh, spectrometer. So we have a, a grating here, and then we have different waveguides. We have five waveguides that each then take the light of different frequency, different colors, essentially, right, to a single photon detector. Okay. So we have four working, uh, four in this case, four de devices. And then we can see, you see, this is the idea, right? The, the light from the corner comes this way, gets dispersed on this grating. And then the red light will go on that side. The bluer light will go on that side and in between. So of course it's not super high, it's, it's a four pixel uh, spectrometer, but nevertheless working the single photon uh, level and uh, with integrated single photon detectors and, and, and so on. So we do some spectroscopy on a single dot uh, all on the chip. Mm -hmm. Then our detectors uh, were also used uh, in, um, in experiments uh, where we did uh, quantum communication. Um, international, I think it's the first international quantum communication experiment. So there was, uh, this is other my old friends uh, from Vienna, Rupert Ursin is, is the person who ran all of this. So they have a, an access to an optical fiber that goes from Sicily to Malta, so 96 kilometers. And they had this source of entangled photons in Sicily and they would uh, measure one of the twins in Sicily and send the other twin photons under the sea to Malta. And there we were waiting with our detector there and measuring there the polarization of it. And at the end of the day, what we could show was entanglement between the two photons, one in Sicily and one in Malta over it, some 96 kilometers. And this is really something essential if you want to do quantum communication, this is the kind of things you need to do. Um, and then our detectors are good for that as well. This is also, this is a, like, 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 like you here, we have a king, right? And here's our king. He was in our lab just before COVID. 
And um, he pushed the red button. I think this is only understood, I think, in the thing. He pushed the red button. But what he did then is he, he started sending single photon from our lab here in, in downtown Stockholm to, uh, to Shista, to Kista uh, here, where there's Ericsson Research Lab, where we also have a... Uh, uh, so we are now sending single photons um, in an optical fiber deployed, right? So it means the neighboring uh, fibers are used for usual communication in Stockholm, okay? And um, there we go. So we and we have been playing ever since with this, and we're of course sending quantum messages and so on from from downtown Stockholm to the outside, and hopefully this will scale up to the whole of Sweden, Scandinavia, Europe, uh, with uh, all kinds of projects as EuroQCI. Hopefully, um, there is just a surprise when you do quantum things. Sometimes you get strange surprises, and this is the measurement we did, one of the first ones on the quantum emission. So we have a quantum dot single photon source here, and we measure what happens here. And what we're expecting is this here. This is from the quantum. We, we accept the quantum. And look at all this. We also get all of this for free. We never ask for that. This is pollution. This is because we're in a cable and the other fibers carry classical communication. So plus lasers with, I guess, milliwatts of laser. And sometimes some of these photons, well, they kind of make their way into our fiber, okay, where we count the photons. And so we're getting, as you see, 10,000 photons per second in our fiber from the neighbors. If we talk to Ericsson engineers, they don't care. I mean, they have absolutely 10,000 photons per second for them is absolutely nothing. But for us, it really ruins our day. So these are the kind of issues we have when we go quantum, even using classical things, we are facing you know, issues that were sometimes not expected. And then I'll just tell you to finish about detectors. I already gave you some ideas. So it's a, it's a Russian invention from 2001. And what they did at the time was something that really um, was Shook the world already, yeah, our Russian friends. So what they did, they, they made a superconducting film um, of thickness of about five nanometers, okay? Uh, width of about 100 nanometers. They made that device, okay? Even lithography. Not... And the big surprise, and they apply a constant current. This is what is shown by, by the arrows here. It's a constant current. Constant current. That is just below the critical current, right? 90%, 95% of the critical current. It's superconducting, okay? Now, what they show is if a single photon is absorbed in that nanowire, one single photon at optical frequencies, it will obviously locally release its energy as heat and destroy the superconducting state. So this is what we show here. This is no more superconducting. And since we're applying this constant current right behind, right, we are now forcing the current we apply to, fl to flow around that hotspot, as it's been called ever since, okay? Okay, but now because it was already 90 or 95 percent, if not 98 percent of the critical current, what we do now we exceed in this region here the critical current density. So the thing is like a fuse; it blows, bang! It goes from superconducting to resistive, from zero ohms to a kilo ohm. This happens within picoseconds. Okay, so it's it's a single photon triggered fuse, if you want. Okay. Uh, bang and what? Well, for once, also nature is kind with us because it recovers. We recover superconductivity spontaneously. We don't have to do anything. It just cools down again and becomes superconducting within nanoseconds. Also, so we don't even have to reduce the current and so on. Okay. And what's I think striking also, 20 years later, right? There is still no clear uh, theory for how this actually operates. I'm telling you about a hotspot and so on. This is still more or less the best, uh, the most state of the art explanation of the whole process. There is no. And especially what I'm really missing, I have to say, is a predictive theory that will tell us which materials are good. Okay? So we just try, all of us in the field, this material, this material, until we find a good one. Okay? So the Russians use niobium nitride, and we're using niobium titanium nitride, just to tell you an example. And we add the titanium, we got to get better, but uh, no theory behind all of this. This is a detection pulse. So here we go. So it's a uh, superconducting, zero, yeah, zero volts, and then suddenly, bang, a single photon is absorbed, and you see a very sharp rise, very, very sharp rise, I'll tell you more about the sharp right, but it's crucial. And then as I, it recovers on its own, we do nothing. It cools down again, thanks to the photon coupling with the substrate. It just becomes superconducting again with a tau, right, of the order of 10 nanoseconds for a typical device. So within 10, 20, 30 nanoseconds, we're ready to detect the next photon. This is what the real devices look like at the end of the day, the ones we were making these days. So we make the nanowire out of the film, right, even lithography and etch, meander over something like about 10 microns of diameter. Why 10 microns? Because the core of an optical fiber, single mode, is that 10 microns. And because what we do is we just place an optical fiber directly on top of that. I mean, just, okay, not always simple, but this is what we do, yeah. So there we go. So uh, sputtering, as you could do here, down the hall here, and then uh, even lithography and, and, and etching. And then we have to take this down to a fairly low temperature, not insanely low, but 2.5 Kelvin or so is what we need to, to do. 
when we started this, right, in, we started working on this like in 2005 or so, there was a lot of cryophobia, as I like to call it. People, oh, 2.5 Kelvin for detector. But I'm looking at this 15 years later, I think we're all used to go down to this kind of temperature. Things are, yeah, standalone, the tabletop and so on. So the, the cryophobia is gone. This is what it looks like. So this is the, the cooling. It would be this, this size. There is a helium compressor and the size of a small washing machine and behind also, but that's all there is. So in terms of um, reliability and I think this is no problem and this runs really 24 seven for, for a year at a time, no problem. Uh, and this I've already shown you and this is just the fabrication steps, which is again, sputtering even lithography etching. So nothing really magical here. Um, and this is how they operate. This is one of the, the final slides I, I want to, to, to show you. So if we, this is the, in red, the detection efficiency of a detector, okay? Uh, measured at 1.3 microns, I think, if I remember correctly. Okay, so we're sending a very weak number, I mean, very few number, few photons on this device. Okay, per second, thousands or so. And uh, we measure the detection event, the, the electrical pulse is coming out, okay? Obviously, if we apply no current, we get no detection efficiency, we get no pulses out. By the time we reach about 15 microamps of current, we start to see our detector detecting, okay? And as we increase the current, you see that it improves and all the way to about this, this is nice here because we reach a very high efficiency of something like 95% efficiency. Oh, I didn't in this case, sorry. yeah. 95% efficiency here, even plateaus, right? So that's, that's the good thing. We have a very efficient detector here. It's also very fast. I come back to that also. Um, there's always a price to pay for things, good things. And this is what you see in black. What you see in black is on the exact same measurement, we measure the dark counts. So if we turn off, if we keep the detector in complete darkness, okay, will it still give us detection events? And it does. Uh, so these are detection events, pulses coming up of the detector, but not triggered by photons, triggered by fluctuations of all kinds. Yeah? Uh, so, so you see there is, if you think about seems noise ratio, you see here, you have 95%, but some dark count, whereas here you still have almost 95 and you have noise ratio. So just to tell you, you can, you can choose using the noise ratio with the detectors because you can sacrifice. And I can just tell you this also for these ultra clean single photon measures I've shown you earlier. What we did is we took our detectors down to 60, we operated there. We sacrificed almost 30% of detection efficiency, but the dark count rate went from, I don't know, 100 counts per second to three millihertz, you see? So that's the thing you can do here. Because if you want to have ultra clean single photons, it's not enough to have an ultra clean single photon source. You also need to have an ultra clean single photon detector. So this is all, all goes hand in hand. The question that everybody is always asking, starting with us is where's the efficiency? Are we going to reach 99, 99.9, 99.99? And um, the question is relevant for many, uh, oh, people were doing quantum computers because if you want to do a photonic quantum computer, there's this um, KLM scheme from 20 years ago where that says, well, if all you have are single photon sources ideal and single photon detectors ideal, you can build a quantum computer, just put enough of those together. But you really need ideal things. You need 99.9999 and the, it's like an open question, but it, the improvement is incredible because when we started 20 years, uh, 10 years ago with uh, our company, we were selling systems with 20 percent efficiency and people were happy. So in, in, in 10 years, we went from 20 to, to, to 90 percent to plus. So that, but indeed, the last persons are very demanding. And I also want to add this one thing. It's not even just making the devices is hard to aim for 95, 97, 98 percent efficiency. The hardest is the measurement, the calibration. How do you, how do you make sure that it's 99 and not, not 98, 97? The arrow bar on, on this year, is extremely hard to get to a very low value. We talked to NIST in the US and so on, we work together with them, but there's, there's no calibration uh, ways that are so precise at this single photon level. So we also have to invent on the way ways to calibrate and measure the efficiency. But that's what, we, what it looks like, for instance, a detector that is optimized, less than speed, right? For 1.3 microns, this is the efficiency you will get compared to whatever else is, is, you could use right? in gas avalanche photodiage and so on. Now, what's interesting here, this is the shape you see here is given by a resonant cavity we build around the detector so that the photons at 1.3 microns or so are going to bounce back and forth be, until they're finally detected, hopefully, right? But of course, this is done at the, uh, we sacrifice the bandwidth. It means a photon that's uh, optically visible or further in infrared will not see the cavity and will, we will miss it. But of course, we can make a cavity for all that. We can translate, which can make a cavity for the visible or for further in infrared. But nevertheless, another open question is, what is the energy detection limit? Can we take single photons at two microns? Uh, yes, three microns, yes. But what about five microns, 10 microns, 20 microns, you know, microwaves? I mean, there are also 
open question. The only thing where we all agree is that the photon has to have more energy than the gap of the superconductor. We need to destroy at least one Cooper pair at the very, very least. I mean, obviously more than one, but so, but it means we could possibly go down in, in the deep in the mid infrared and still detect single photons, which has so far never been possible. So you can do quantum optics further out in the infrared and mid infrared than you could ever before. It's the same thing in, in, in the blue. So we recently published a paper we showed single X ray photon detection. Okay. Of course, this is not so hard to do. I mean, we're not the only ones because the, the photons there are like little bumps, carry so much energy that detecting one is not really a challenge. But it's still interesting to, to see that these type of detectors operate extremely well from X-rays to the mid infrared. Okay? And this needs to still be like understood and, and so on. So the X-rays are better. And the last thing I want to touch on about this data is the time resolution. Okay? Um, here is the early days. This is maybe 10 years old now. This is a time jitter measurement. So what we do, we have our single photon source and we come with a very short laser pulse, very weak, of course, down to this very, but we come with a very short laser pulse and we ask our detector, okay, how precisely do we get the electrical pulse out, detection pulse, compared to when the laser pulse arrived, okay? And we see that in the early days, we had a time resolution or timing jitter, you can call it, of 80 picoseconds or so. We could tell you within 80 picoseconds when the photon arrived, okay? And then what we did, is we developed a cryogenic uh, amplifier. So silicon germanium type of things, okay? And now we have an amplifier that is right there in the cryostat, very close from the detector, okay? Only centimeters away at low temperature. So it's, it's, it's itself less noisy, it's close. It can have also the right input impedance compared to 50 ohms, if you don't want 50 ohms. And just using the same kind of devices, we only add here a better amplifier. We went down to about 10 picoseconds, okay? No, 10 picoseconds starts to be, I think, very interesting because in 10 picoseconds, light travels three millimeters. Okay, so we can tell you now by doing a, a simple time of flight measurement, how far light travels within three millimeters. Yeah? And this is not the end. I mean, this is, this is not the end. So we are, we've been going down below 10 picoseconds. So, and again, no one knows where the limit is. So we just set ourselves a, a, a goal of going better than one picosecond. That would enable us to tell how far light travel yeah, uh, within 100 microns, just by measuring the time it took for a pulse of light, a laser pulse to travel, or like pulse light. Okay, and of course this is another thing where these detectors stand out in terms of. Um, and this is just to show you, we can combine all of these things at different frequencies because I told you we can we can make devices optimized for the visible or for the infrared or further out and so on. And this is what we did. So this device here, for instance, shows 14 picoseconds. It's not the best. Uh, the uh, graph here, I have 14 picoseconds of time jitter, and this is measured at three microns. So a bit out in the infrared compared to where you, we usually operate. So we can really combine very high efficiency uh, with also very high time resolution. And the telecom at, uh, at 1.5 uh, microns, we can combine extremely high efficiency. We have shown, we just recently published uh, uh, late last year, uh, more than 99% efficiency. Okay. Uh, so very high at 1.3, 1 1.5 microns. And again, with a very good time resolution. And in the visible, there also we can get very high. Of course, in the visible, it's a, as I said, it's a bit easier, right? Because each photon has so much energy that it's like detecting a little bump each time, so to say. Just to tell you also, obviously, you've seen what the devices look like. This, uh, it's like a grating, essentially, right? So you can expect a polarization independence. At one polarization will get absorbed more efficiently than the other one. It's the case in the lab, in simulations. But then what we've shown with our friends in, in, at CA in Grenoble, that we, if you um, embed the, the structure in a, in a dielectric with the right refractive index in the right structure, you can actually erase this uh, uh, polarization behavior or dependence. You can erase it for, for a given small frequency range. And usually we did and then we simulations and then we, we did it and it, it actually worked. So this is just to tell you that. One of the very last slides and uh, there is a need, so we're making these systems, we're usually happy with two or four detectors in our lab, but there's all this uh, work done, for instance, in China, the, the, the quantum photonic uh, quantum computer, uh, where they recently, I mean, recently, a year, a year ago now, a year ago now, over a year ago, showed an advantage, right? They were getting this uh, Torontonian of a matrix, I don't know if it's useful for anyone, but anyway, they could do this in a quantum way, uh, and for this, they need about 100 detectors. Okay, single photon detectors of, of that type. And then of course they want to scale up and many others want to scale up. So it seems that the number of detectors we're gonna use or need and for some applications is gonna scale up in, a, in an intense way. So this is, I should have a proper picture instead, but this is the system we built at KTH. 
And it's just a large cryostat. We just bought the largest things we could buy on the market. And now we have a system that is able to host 1,000 detectors. So we can now have 1,000 single quantum detectors in one system. It's possible. Um, a single quantum now has 24. It says 16, but you see 24 here. So they're scaling up at the company on their you know, safe way in a company. At the university, we can go crazy. So we go for 1,000. And then there's a, a problem, a bottleneck we were not even thinking about, but it's a simple one. What I call the APD, the avalanche of photodetection data. For every photon we detect, we get an electrical pulse. And what we do with this, we timestamp it. So we use off-the-shelf electronics and we just measure the exact arrival time of every pulse. Yeah. So I should know that, but I'm not often in the lab enough to tell you how many, but it's a, a good kilobit of information from every photon. That's even a kilobyte of it. For every photon, we have we generate uh, right, uh, in a data file the arrival time within picoseconds. So it's a long number. Okay. So if every if every detector can detect 80 megahertz, right? Okay. So if it's a kilobyte per event and it's 80 megahertz, you already have 80 gigabytes per, de per detector. And then if you have a thousand of those, I mean, it becomes CERN like, I mean, there is nothing, we can't handle this. So we can make good systems. We can make them, we can provide them, but we have no idea in how to like, if this thing really works at a megahertz or 10 megahertz detection events per second, we have no idea on how to handle the classical data that comes out. So this will require quite some uh, classical computing efforts, I think, to, to, to or cryo CMOS, whatever, I don't know. Anyway, uh, that's an interesting problem. This is just what we can do with this. So we can, in our lab, uh, send a laser pulse, telecom, 1.5 microns, eye safe, invisible, whatever. Uh, and then we measure the time it takes for the, as we scan our laser on, on the little figurine here, we measure the time it takes for the laser pulse to come back. And this is what you see. So we can, this is obtained here by just measuring how, how long it takes for a single photon, right, to come back from the statue, right? for every orient direction. And we can have really, as you can see, millimeter-like uh, resolution at the single photon level. Uh, that's uh, now possible. And what we would now want to do is atmospheric pollution measurements, uh, another but similar concept, but on CO2. So to conclude, I have shown you that we can generate single and entangled photons uh, at telecom frequencies with quantum dots, okay? This we hope is going to be very useful for quantum communication but also with integrated photonics for quantum computation and maybe quantum sensing as well. Okay, This is uh, an important uh, resource that we need, and this is really becoming now available and reliable. Okay, uh, We can then also go for integrated quantum photonics and put a large number of these uh, elements all on a very small chip of a square centimeter or less. Okay, um, Single photon detectors, those based on these superconducting nanostructures are after 20 years after the invention, right, are reaching uh, their physical limit in terms of time resolution, detection efficiency. There's more to, to talk about, photon number resolution, polarization independence, and so on. It's incredible. They, they, they have taken us in, in such a short time to near perfection, and it's, it's incredible. And uh, now we also have, we're starting to play also now within Stockholm uh, in this network where we are now doing quantum communication uh, using true single photons, yeah? So that's what I wanted to tell you, and I'm Looking forward to more discussions. And so thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. I'm making progress. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Lydia. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any, yeah. Anybody would like to have a question? Thank you. Ah, thanks for the, for the talk. Um, back to your um, add drop filter to select the. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I was wondering. So, so when you do that, the, the, the quantum dot is already uh, is on chip, is on the same chip, or is it separate? Yes, it's on the same chip. Yes. And you don't kill the the single photon uh, Not properties. Not too much. I mean, uh, let's. Do, so it's on the same chip, and this is and the proof it's on the same chip. I mean, I should have a slide which I but it's that the quantum dot emission you see changes the frequency changes the, the wavelength because of the heating because we're warming up the ring. But the dot is only 10, 20 microns behind. It also warms up a bit, okay. and it gives you this effect. Because the, in principle, that should be a straight line. You know, but it is not because the quantum dot warms up. And then what we, you could calculate, if you want to measure the warming up of the quantum dot just by looking at this shift here compared to mm -hmm. a vertical line. So that, yes, it is. And then I see I'm missing a slide where we used a MEMS devices okay, yeah. uh, to do the tuning. Because this is a problem, and I lost it fell off the plane, I don't know, but there's there a slide that I'm missing, where, where what I wanted to show you is a paper we had in NatureCom uh, 
just early last year, um, to avoid the heating effect, we are using MEMS. So we have the two waveguides on MEMS, right? And we can deflect one, so we can modify the coupling between one and the other. Yeah, and this gives us you know, the tuning of the of the of the tuning, but no warming up. Yeah, and I guess also it's uh, faster. It's be it's better. Yes, it's more stable. It's better. It's only better. It's just more work in the kit room. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much for, for nice talk. So just one question is just a curiosity. Mm. You mentioned the, the review oscillations, yeah? Yes. That it, it was some combination of quantum, electron, and photon. And I, I am wondering why, why you cannot use this, uh, this quantum entanglement between the photon and the electron just to make quantum computing all inside the, the same device without waiting to, to the photon to, to leave oh, the device? Sure. That, that's a possibility, yes. We could also aim in this direction. So when, when it comes to selecting the right... Um, implementation of quantum computation, right? Should we, I am, I am very lost myself. I, 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 I'm very happy making the devices that I hope will be of some use, but which uh, approach exactly to, to use? Should the photon itself be the qubit? Or we, what we can also do, I was looking for the, the, the Rabi oscillations, uh, but I, I have them there as well. Here, here we, I didn't mention this, but here they are as well. Uh, so, Yes, I mean the answer is just yes. But I just do not know enough about the 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 the, the, the theory, so to say, of which uh, which implementation is the most promising. Which one should we really aim for? Yeah, because you mentioned that you have problems to make the photons outside of the of the emitter. Yes. No? So do, the this will avoid out. this problem. Or less. Yes, exactly. Getting the photon out of the device in the emitter is a challenge. So what 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 can be done? For instance, uh, a group in, in Israel of um, uh, David Gershoni has done this beautiful work where. What they have in the quantum dot is always one version electron that always stay there. So they always use a, a charge exciton, which we also have uh, sometimes. Uh, so uh, this T here is a trion. The trion is an exciton plus one electron or one hole, depend, but a charge, a singly charged exciton. What happens then is the electron hole recombines, okay, giving you a photon, but the electron, the resident electron stays there and sees many successive generations of, of emission events. And you can use this uh, spin there that stays in the quantum dot to, to ensure entanglement among the successive photons. So that's the kind of, of very interesting uh, state you can prepare by controlling the charge state. Yes. And then if you lose one, well, you lost one, but you can use the next one then. Yes, you're right. Thank, thank you very much. Mm. <laughs> have to go this way. I have a question about the uh, detection part. Yes, so fine. you have uh, shown that you can detect by just quenching the superconducting uh, state, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so how do you make sure that this is a single photon that is absorbed? Uh, it's a very good question because this takes us on another big topic that I did not cover at all is photon number resolution, right? Uh, for many schemes uh, in quantum computation, you need photon number resolution that is tell if it's one photons or two photons or three photons that came in the same pulse, okay, together. Uh, there is this requirement in, in many cases. Um, so what, 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 what we do, there's several uh, answers to that. The first one is we have a single photon source and when we do this single photon measurement where at time zero, there is no correlations, that shows that we're detecting single photons. So our measurement, like the ultra clean one I showed earlier, really showed it's a single photon detector. That's one. But now, um, so many people are asking us, can you resolve photon number? This is one from two and, and even beyond. And there, what we see, also it's a simple device. It's really, it's a fuse, it's an on-off thing, right? I mean, you would say, well, if a one photon comes or, or a milliwatt or when a billion photon come, all what will happen is that the device will switch from superconducting to resistive, period. So it should give you the same detection pulse each and every time. What we see now, it's unpublished data, just don't tell you this, but I'm sure it will be at some point published. Uh, when we took this, take these oscilloscope traces, right? And compare them when we come with single photons and we come with two photons, we see differences in the shape. So this very precise shape here is photon number dependent. And between one and two, the difference is so large that I think we can say that we can distinguish very well. There is no overlap. We can say with no, with high fidelity, with no ambiguity, that it's one or it's two. Uh, then they start to overlap later on. If you ask us if it's five or six, it becomes very hard. 
but this is the, the, the way we, we, we can do it also. Um, there's this, so the pearl shape carries much more information than we ever thought. But then it comes back a little bit again to this avalanche of photo data, photo detection data that we have. Because what we usually do, we set a trigger level, right? Somewhere there where it's the highest. And we just see if it goes above the trigger level, we said it was a photon and we're done. If you want to do what we're talking about now, you need to measure the whole pearl shape. So the amount of data you need to, again, like acquire and, 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 and crunch to see if it was one or two photons is, 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 is again, staggering because no, every, every detection event is no more just a trigger value. You acquire, you digitalize the whole pearl shape and analyze it. So my main fear is that uh, it can be done in the lab again. Uh, but if you want to do this at a megahertz or so, and you need, again, computing power that is completely crazy. But there is indeed, and this is very new, eh? uh, information in the pearl shape. Yes, yes. And there is other ways. I mean, there is the TES sensors, transition edge sensors. Uh, so it's also semi superconductors cool down, but they act as bolometers. There, you just measure the heat that a photon uh, brought. And if you have two photons, you get double, then you got one. The problem with those is that they work at millikelvin temperatures, so that the cooling starts to be a bit uh, hard to do. And they are very slow. You can only run at kilohertz. So you cannot use a regular <coughs> megahertz rep rate laser. You have to go very slow. But there are other techniques. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank do we have questions in the chat? Perhaps we don't. Okay, I just have a quick question. So you, you said that we're reaching the limits with, for example, some of the technologies. Yes, we are. So are we in a situation that we have to look at other fields like single molecules or something? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think for detection, uh, I think for photo detection, single photons, I think the, these uh, super connecting nanowires mm -hmm. are getting us incredibly close to the physical limit. Um, now the price to pay is cooling. So Greta Thunberg will not be happy, right? She's not amused because uh, we're using a kilowatt of uh, electricity to cool down our detectors. Luckily, with a kilowatt, we can cool down a large number of detectors. One, but also 24, 36, 48 also, it seems. But nevertheless, there is, uh, we will not violate physics by doing this at room temperature. Okay. Yeah, so that's the next thing that can be done. Maybe equally good detectors, but operating at much higher temperatures, okay? But okay, I don't know how to do that. But it, one day, I think if we come back in a hundred years from now, I, I assume it will be done, but I don't know. Then for the single photon sources, there's still uh, quite some problems. Um, the quantum dots are not ideal. Again, not only the cooling, there's many issues, but then there's uh, many things. The ND centers also have some issues and not tunable really. I mean, there's one frequency or so. But there's in the 2D materials, there's a, this is the, the, the currently hot topic, right? Uh, there may be something exciting will come out. Uh, that could be room temperature also, more efficient. If you're, if you're in 2D material, it's easy to get the light out because it's yes. not in anything, it's just in a 2D layer. So, so yes, that's a, a good solution for that. Molecules have been good for a long time, but they bleach, they blink. You need a molecule that really stays a molecule for you know a day, a week, a month, a year, and usually they die within minutes or seconds. Ten thousand events and gone they are. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We have a question from the chat from our colleague class Tielroy, and he's asking uh, that you mentioned that the detectors work up to the medium infrared. Okay. And so, would it be possible to detect them with terahertz light? It's a very good question that we've been discussing over coffee for quite some time already. Yes, thank you for the question. And I can tell you, we have a project we just submitted with VTT in Finland to aim for that. So we'd like to go there. It only depends what you, how do you define terahertz, but it's like nano. I mean, what's nano? 10 nanometers, 100 nanometers, 1,000 nanometers. So terahertz is the same. Is it one terahertz, 10 terahertz, 1,000 terahertz, 1 million terahertz? So the question is there. But nevertheless, what has been shown by uh, the, the Russian group that started the whole field uh, they have already shown single photon detection with, of course, very low frequency, down to 10 microns of wavelength. And 10 microns of wavelength starts to be where I think some people will start to agree that you start to enter the terrorist range. So this has been shown, so we want to take it from there. I've shown you that we have been going to three microns so far in, in our lab in Stockholm. So we want to go on uh, with the efficient devices, and we are aiming at 10 microns and then a bit beyond. But we are telling the EU currently that if they fund us, we will go for 10 microns efficiently and we'll do our best to go beyond 10 microns. So yes, I, I totally agree. And this is so interesting because it's never been possible 
to, you know, one day we'll be listening to the radio uh, with, with single photon detectors. I hope. Yes. Oh, I think we'll, we'll get there before with our photoacoustic devices. Oh, right. okay. 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 <laughs> well, uh, if there are no more questions, then thank you very much to right, Francesc.